Mega Man X2 is the second extreme game in the Extreme series produced by Capcom Studio Production 3. Still following the format as the previous installment on Game Boy Color, Extreme 2 plays, looks, and sounds similar, but with increased difficulty, the ability to play at zero to the fullest, and with Iris as their navigator due to developers feeling sorry for her in the events of Mega Man X4, giving her a more youthful look to the equivalent of a schoolgirl. Mega Man Extreme 2 takes place before the events of Mega Man X4, so having her look younger than she does in X4 is a reasonable choice for her design. Burkana and Gareth were designed as a witch and a knight respectively. Illustrator Haruki Suitsugu designed a lion companion for Gareth, but this design was never used for the final game, stating that if the player could just assume that the lion loyally follows Gareth everywhere, but not in any way that is visually confirmable within the game, that would be great. The game will be released in Japan in March of 2001, with the Wednesday release later in May of the same year. The eShop releases for Extreme 2 were set between 2013 and 2014 for Japan and the West respectively. Although the reception was mixed to positive by critics on a personal standpoint, and as you can tell by the title, Mega Man Extreme 2 is the worst of the Extreme duology. In Mega Man Extreme 2, X and Zero are sent on a mission on Lagoo's Island, where they discover that Red Boys use the function. The ones responsible for this are two mysterious Red Boys, Burkana and Gareth, who are known as the Soul Erasers. These two Red Boys are gathering DNA souls, though Gareth claimed that he was only erasing souls in Mavericks. X and Zero didn't believe him, so Gareth issued a game for X and Zero to retire eight Guardians on the island. If they succeed, they would be granted an audience with Burkana and Gareth personally. Speaking of Burkana, she was the one who issued the game to begin with. Gareth was against the idea due to him knowing of how dangerous X and Zero are, but Burkana was enjoying the performance thus far after X and Zero terminated two Guardians. After retiring all the Guardians on the island, X and Zero were invited to the Red Boy Research Laboratory, where they meet Burkana and Gareth face to face. Gareth explained the purpose of the sacrifices was to be experimental samples. X and Zero then split up to find and destroy Burkana and Gareth. Once Burkana and Gareth are defeated, Sigma appears who instigated the Erasure incident. X and Zero then finish operation by defeating Sigma and all the DNA souls return to their rightful hosts. This would actually serve as the introduction to Red Boy's Seven Souls or the equivalent to a human soul. Later in the series, DNA Souls become a crucial part of the X series as they have the ability to strengthen Red Boys and create clones. Here in Extreme 2, DNA Souls are used to revive Red Boys, which X and Zero discovered. Burkana began experimenting with DNA Souls in order to become stronger. Ergo, can be a match for X and Zero. Gareth is Burkana's henchman and follows her orders, but can be skeptical about her motives. Although Burkana's experiments of DNA souls are diabolical, I wish that this plot point was carried out even further. She may be getting stronger, but she could use that very knowledge to usher the new age of Reploids. Mavericks that are destroyed can have their DNA souls removed to strengthen Reploids that could put the DNA soul to better use, something that Gareth mentioned earlier. Even though Gareth has his viewpoints in the situation, his motivations leave a lot to be desired. He's on board with Burkana in terms of using souls to become stronger, but as I stated previously, this would have been a start to create a new age of Reploids. But the one who was behind this game from the very beginning was Sigma. He used Burkana and Garrett to do his bidding and took it upon himself to attempt to erase X and Zero's DNA souls after X and Zero defeated Burkana and Garrett. But why erase them when he can simply just use them for his own benefit? There could have been some real potential with this story, especially with Burkana herself as an interesting antagonist who used DNA souls for strength and could have used it to build her own utopia, especially after the increasing magic activity at the Sigma's rebellion. This also applies to Garrett as he follows Burkana Burkana's path and acts as her protective guardian. I wouldn't say that this is the worst story in the X series, but definitely something to explore and expand upon. Mega Man Extreme 2 may have had an intriguing story, but compelling gameplay it does not have. In the beginning, players can choose which side of the story to play first, whether it be X or Zero via their missions. The initial stages are similar except when they split up, but they meet up after destroying Skullhead. Similar to Extreme 1, only 4 of the 8 members can be fought. For X, he battles against Neon Tiger, Launch Octopus, Volt Catfish, and Flame Mammoth. While Zero battles Wire Sponge, Blast Hornet, Overdrive Ostrich, and Tunnel Rhino. I started with Zero's mission and then play X's mission 
after. Wire Sponge this stage, the weather control, is similar to that of X2. Same enemies, same layout, except there's another elevator at the end, with their specific spike ball layout. The fight against Wire Sponge is also similar to X2, but Wire Sponge himself moves slowly compared to how he moves in X2. So still similar to X2, but with another elevator at the end. Blast Hornet stage, the aerial battleship, is riddled with spy copters, kill boons, and one giant bottomless chasm. I will admit that hopping over the spy copters is quite thrilling, but getting blindsided by kill boons is not, especially when jumping over gas when they're not fully visible. But if kill boons aren't the problem, either the turn cannons or the flamers will be. Zero against the flamers isn't the best matchup for them, and the same could be said for the turn cannons as well. Maneuvering with these flying platforms that can change directions simply by pressing the button would be an easy part if it wasn't for the turn cannon shooting zero or the cube boons waiting to get the drop on them. Then comes the core mini boss where destroying the core glowing red is the way to destroy it, all while putting up with cube boons as well. I really appreciate how this stage uses the death rockmer aesthetic from the airport from X1. That's a nice Formigo callback right there. The fight against Blast Hornet is close to the fight from X3. He now shoots bees that take a while to move and his stinger is more lethal than usual. This fight is simply fine but I prefer the fight from X3. And even though I like the idea of jumping from spy cover to the spike copter, I dislike getting blindsided by enemies while traveling high in the air. Still a shame that spike copter can be fought in gameplay. Overdrive Ostrich stage. The desert is significantly different. The stage begins and ends on the land chaser, but on foot in the middle. In Mr. Traveling, there are instant death hazards via these tornado contraptions with the same enemies as before from X2. The land chaser is only capable of dashing through enemies, and even then, this can cause damage to the vehicle. Having a blaster of some sort would have been beneficial than a suicidal dash attack, especially when dashing through breakable walls can lead to zero crashing and dying. The Overdrive Ostrich fight is similar to the fight from X2, but the area itself it's smaller. Instead of shooting down a missile, Zero goes through a door that just disappears and then the fight starts. So this stage has land chase sequences that were done better in X2. The instant kill hazards aren't difficult to maneuver through but they kill instantly when touched and the fight against Overdrive Ostrich is a downgrade compared to X2 with smaller space to move around in. So all in all, not bad but not great either. Tunnel Rhino stage, the underground has a complete change. The intro now has the rocks being an enemy instead of just an obstacle. Even standing on them isn't ideal as they can still cause damage. There are no hanging rocks or sand traps that pushes anyone downward on conveyor belts or spikes, but there are now right armors which I think is a nice change. There are even spots where a right armor can crash through the cracked ground leading to a lower level, filled with spikes and other right armor enemies. So if Zero happened to jump out of the right armor and then fall to a lower level, the right armor disappears and Zero will land on spikes instead. Up ahead is a firewall hazard that rises and falls at a timely matter. This isn't it to kill, but still needs to be avoided nonetheless. Finally, there's Tana Rhino, who does more than just move back and forth and shoots drills. He can also kick up rocks as he dashes across the ground. I wish he did this more often and does his next three. But in the end, this is Tana Rhino. There's almost no difference here. Moving on to X's mission is Neon Tiger stage, the jungle but there are giant punchable trees and platforms to ride on. There's even a forest set to reference in the later half, except there's no mud and instead spikes. Using a right number is ideal. The right number is also effective against gemming ways. Or not. The fight against Neon Tiger is much slower compared to his X3 counterpart. He still moves across the wall, shoots beams from his tail, but now it's not telegraphed when he'll be using his claws. Although the stage itself is straightforward with a nice right armor section at the end, which could have been better if it was similar to the forest sector from X1, the fight against Neon Tiger was done better in X3. Launch Octopus's stage, the ocean base, is more of the same as the remaining entrance from X1, but with less hazards, smaller Otoboroses, a cruiser that disappears when crashing under water, and two separate paths to traverse through. The Anglers are less lethal than they were in X1, but the Gulpers are still Gulpers. Launch Octopus has been slowed down and he shoots fewer torpedoes than he did in X1. I consider this more tolerable than his X1 counterpart, but I think I prefer his fight from Memory Hunter X. I can say with confidence that choosing this as a first pick has barely any repercussions, unlike in X1 where fighting Launch Octopus felt pressuring, especially for players that never played X1 before. This stage and even the fight is alright, barely any complaints here. Vault Catfish's stage, the hydroelectric power plant, takes notes from Spark Mentor with electro sparks traveling across the ground and is a little reference to the wastewater dam from X3. The biggest nuisance in this stage, however, are the batons. The moment they start swarming, that presents a problem. The Earth Commanders are much better suited for this environment, especially when traveling upward. Then comes the highlight of this stage, water geysers. This one isn't threatening as it simply just pushes X back with great force. Now for the real problem, electric water. This is insta-kill. One touch is another 
enough for immediate destruction. Hope you don't have butterfingers when grabbing that hard tank. Because that happens. One letter climbs to the outside later and exits out the fight for catfish. He still belly flies, but now he's able to vacuum while shooting lightning bolts through these two light bolts, and he also shoots with tri thunders. Except these are easier to dodge than they are in X3. In fact, I think Volt Catfish has a much better fight in X3 2 than he does in X3. But if it weren't for his suction attack, which can hold X in a bind, I would tolerate this stage more if it didn't have electric water and less baton activity. I consider this a spike in difficulty because of how treacherous the stage really is. Proceed with caution with this one. Lastly, there's the factory where Flame Mammoth is. This is just Flame Mammoth, but with one change that let's just say I'm not a fan of. Remember in X1 how the fire pillars just crept up and destroyed parts of the bridge? In X2, these fireballs are sent flying from the lava with barely any time for X to simply evade it in time. This is the one change that I will never comprehend and the main reason why I don't like the factory this time around. Flame Mammoth has gotten a bit of a speed upgrade as he now moves faster than he normally did in X1. He's not running marathons anytime soon, but he does enough to keep up with X, but the drawback is how the fight starts. In X1, when X lands on the conveyor belt, the fight doesn't start until Flame Mammoth is on screen. In X2, he launches himself at X without even revealing himself on screen, but you do hear him tooting his horn. I would say it's the same as last time, but just like with the hydroelectric power plant, proceed with caution, especially those fireballs, they are no joke. After retiring all eight guardians, X and Zero storm the lab to fight for Kana and Gareth. If you recall the Observatory Hall or the Kawinger Tower, then the first part of the lab is a combination of the two. Except this second platform that moves in two separate directions. I thought this would be a crushing hazard, but no, X and Zero just phase right through it and fall. But the rest of the stage is similar to the two mentioned stages, except the waterfall portion has bladies you can barely see, unless you just climb the wall, and the raid track that continue their sentry duty with flamers that evade the blindside you. It all wraps up with Velgarder, who acts as way that he did in X1. This whole stage is like X1 but smaller, which is both a good and a bad thing. I would appreciate this more if the stage layout in enemy placement was more stretched out so that enemies won't come out of nowhere or if X here doesn't just lunge himself at a flamer here. This stage is a double-edged sword for me. It's both good and bad at the same time. The second part of the lab is the worst part. It's like the Arctic Reserve from X2, but on steroids. It starts off pretty similar to X2, but now there's electricity all over the place, which, by the way, is instant kill. These are no different than Spice, which begs the question, why are these instant kill now when they weren't from X2? Now X and Zero need to traverse between these death hazards, all while sliding down these walls with crab blasters and more electricity that you can barely see. This is way worse than getting the Shoryuken from X2. Even after that, there are bar wings and gun vaults to fight through all while avoiding the fire. At the end of it all, the boss itself will be the reason you have to play this whole section of the lab over and over and over again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Isis and Sowillo, the worst boss in the entire game. After taking more steps than they should, X and Zero counter this truckload of nonsense right here. It takes up three fourths of the screen, has a drill that makes cross quarter combat a pain, electro balls that are nearly impossible to dodge, and anytime the yellow head here is struck, it fires a missile from his mouth. Even using Zero's final will target the purple platform and not the boss. This is awful and I hate it every second of it. Even fighting this boss at zero isn't bearable. This is atrocious in every sense of the word. It's bad. Written in all capitals. So after all that mayhem, X and Zero, after fighting through Cubion and Aglandas, split up the fight Burkana and Gareth. Zero fights through Hagamers and Bukunes, and hopefully he doesn't dash right in front of them, all while fighting dry moles and avoiding electric water. More electricity, by the way. He'll have to descend slowly to reach Gareth. When he does, Gareth throws lances and uses his shield when struck up front. He'll also jump up high and throw more lances, which will take a while for him to drop. This boss isn't really that bad, but the stage to get to him is, and Burkana stays isn't better. To reach Burkana, X will have to fight more Eglandas, all while avoiding electric water. Even this jump right here. He'll have to dash upwards and make his way across. So this means that if he doesn't have the leg parts, this is as far as he goes because for some odd reason, he can't simply just wall jump on this wall right here. The only thing he can do is jump up on that platform and he only has one shot. If he misses his chance, 
one perilous trick later and he can finally fight Burkana. She's not much of a fighter like Gareth is, so what she does is trick X of one of two abilities, which is telegraphed by the letter she shoots. If X is hit with an A attack, he won't be able to jump and Burkana shoots fireball to travel on the floor that X has to jump over you see the problem here. The B attack prevents X from attacking and the floor becomes spikes. Burkana then shoots icicles from the ground which are easy to dodge or from the ceiling which can or won't hit X when they spawn in. This fight would be better if it was more like the Captain K. Rool fight from Donkey Kong Country 2 where K. Rool shoots these weird colored blob things that either slow down movement or reverse controls. Here, X can't jump when hit with the A attack but he needs to jump over these fireballs or how the platform X needs to stand on isn't centered in the room and it's too close to the ceiling where the icicles spawn at. Also as a side note, really annoying how X shoots her, she just teleports right above him when he's trying to avoid her button attacks. It is really aggravating. Between Burkana and Gareth, I honestly prefer fighting Gareth because his fight isn't as headache inducing as Burkana's is, and her room honestly is never a fun thing to go through. After finishing both X's and Zero's missions, Extreme Mode is online where the final story can Wait. What? Where's extreme mode? I played through all the stories, so what gives? Hold on a second. What's wrong? Oh, that is bull- You mean to tell me that I had to play through X's mission first and then Zero's mission to unlock extreme mode? Or just pay 2,000 DNA souls just to unlock it? Well, downloading your ROM hack, f this. Now it comes extreme mode where the final story can be realized. What could possibly go wrong? How about those fireballs I mentioned earlier that can now insta-kill you? Now X and Zero need a tiptoe just to not get one-shotted. How about launch octopus's tornado attack that can potentially trap X and Zero and just damage them to death? How about wire sponges landing attack that can actually track where X and Zero are that can blindsight them at first strike? How about blast hornet moving in an L-shaped movement while colliding with X and Zero? But I like how Tonal Rhino shoots his drill to the ground, and Flame Memon shooting his flame like Bowser with Super Mario World is cool too, and I guess how Vol Cafe shooting his tri thunder directly at X isn't that bad either. Honestly, if the game just started with all eight guardians, this would have been much better. And the ability to switch between X and Zero is simple with these, as long as you don't have weapon change mapped to the select button. Actually, I need to talk about the power ups for a moment. Although getting the sub tanks is not that difficult and finding capsules isn't that bad either, especially when a weapon or a technique is required. <laughs> if it actually works, but hard tanks are rather tricky to find. X doesn't have the item tracer, but the hard tank, where the weather control is, is still in the same spot as it was in X2, so a brilliant complaint there if you know where it is if you play X2. Falling through the cramped floor in the underground means restarting just to get a better shot at getting this. Gotta jump at the apex here, gotta slide down the wall and jump over a helicopter here, gotta get this one before the glacier water comes in and... The desert tanks know some jet stingray, the hard tank is high above a tree, and my personal favorite, getting the hard tank at the factory. Back in X1, freezing the lava was mandatory to simply just walk on the floor here to obtain the hard tank. Wanna know how to freeze the lava to reach the hard tank in Xtreme 2? Well, that's just it. You cannot. X and Zero have to intentionally hurt themselves to grab this hard tank because there's no possible way to cause anything to occur to walk on the lava. The floor is literally lava and X and Zero have to walk on it to get the hard tank. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse than that, well, unfortunately, X and Zero have to traverse to the lab from the beginning. Again, this means they have to brute force every enemy, every obstacle, every boss just to fight Burkana and Gareth again. Depending on which character you're playing as, and to make this more bearable, approach this part of the stage as zero. It will save you some time.
After that, there's one stage left. Crossing through these large gas with batons all over the ceiling leads Exon Zero to the refights, where they fight the Guardians all over again. This leaves the Neo Sigma after fighting through right armors and crab blasters, and I'm just gonna say it right now, this fight isn't the best, mainly because the room is too small. Even in X2, where the room was perfectly spacious for X to move around and dodge all the Sigma's attacks, here, the room is significantly smaller and Sigma doesn't even glow when readying his electric attack. He just lets it loose. After that, the final confrontation would be Sigma. Recall what I mentioned about that lion that Tsuyutsugu made? I may have an idea where that went. Beast Sigma shoots green energy balls that fade in and trap the hunters everywhere they go. Beast Sigma is color oriented, so blue means X can damage it, and red means zero can damage it. Didn't know that when I first played this, it's almost as if it was just fine just fighting the thing normally without any of this color nonsense. Damaging the beast enough times causes Sigma to pop out, but the collision of the beast is still there, so using the marine tornado is not the safest weapon to use here. Halfway down, and beast segment will begin to charge and shoot barriers. If he charges at the hunters with the corresponding color, the hunter with that color will have to defend themselves, whether it's zero bouncing back beast segment with their saber, or X using charge shots to push him back. Using that ultimate buster part is perfect for this, as charging the buster is time consuming. But all of this would be fine if the color matching just wasn't a thing. And before before I forget, if you suddenly get a game over here, you have to redo the whole stage again. From the beginning. Before the refights. X and Zero have to fight the Mavericks again. Yeah, let me just snap this open. It's, um,. Blueberry sparkling water. So, anytime that X is zero game over during the Sigma or B Sigma fight, they have to redo that whole stage again. Why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. So after that shocking revelation, I took it upon myself to grind for extra lives just to mitigate the pain. Watch out for that foot. Mother And eventually... That sweet release. Hallelujah. The DNA souls are released and X and Zero return to Maverick Hunter HQ. Not bad for us, his first mission with the Hunters. After that, you unlock boss rush mode where you get to refight the Guardian bosses. No, thank you! And that's Mega Man Extreme 2. Definitely the worst of the Extreme duology, and that's not an exaggeration. The instant kill hazards, hazards now instant death because of Extreme mode, the fact that you need to play X's mission first and then Zero's mission to unlock Extreme mode, unless you want to fork over 2000 DNA souls. Fighting Sigma is a pain, fighting B Sigma is more of a pain, Isis and Suello can literally drive off a cliff, and the fact that either one hunter going down results in a life loss instead of just switching to the other hunter, which by the way, switching only counts if one hunter is not taking damage or not in their recovery state or iframes, so they can't even switch out when they need to. I can appreciate the upgrades as gets, but why not the auto heal chip from X3 for the head part or maybe less weapon consumption like in X5. And perhaps one of the biggest and perhaps over look problems a character switching in the X series is something I call the winner spoils effect, meaning that whomever defeats a certain maverick or obtains a heart tank, that maverick hunter receives that weapon, technique, or heart tank. There is no splitting the reward, something that gets addressed in a ROM hack. Minor details like that are what drag the game down even more. So what are the more positive aspects of Extreme 2? Well, Iris is a navigator in this game after the developers felt sorry for what became of her in X4, though switching isn't how I like it, is fast and fluent. The new weapons this time around, like the Bomb B or the Rayclaw, are pretty good, and the part system is reliable. X and Zero can upgrade their Buster and Sabers respectively, recover more from health drops, and use less energy 
when using weapons or techniques, and Burkana's design is quite fabulous, I might add. Other than that, Mega Man X2 is simply not good. Combined with all the major minor problems I listed, this is one game in the X series I honestly can't come back to. Between X2 1 and X2 2, I would go to X2 1 in a heartbeat. And to be perfectly honest, why not just remake these? No, I'm serious. Anytime that I think about what these could be now, I immediately think of a fan game called Mega Man X Innocent Impulse. It's 8 bit, has fluent gameplay, and I'm pretty sure it's fun to control when the game added controller support anyway. When I think of what X2 could be now, I think of X2 Impulse. How this game looks in 8 bit is how I imagine what X2 could be now, like a Mega Man Extreme pixel remaster, with all of the issues either fixed or removed so that the games are actually enjoyable or better than they are. As it is right now, you're not missing much in Extreme other than a game on the Game Boy Color that would have been better if it was on Game Boy Advance with better controls. Extreme 2 is not only one of the worst experiences I've had from a video game, but it was exhausting afterwards. There are some redeemable factors in this game, but it's overshadowed with all of the irritating and aggravating design aspects that it can live without. Even with ROM hacks, I still can't come back to this. Mega Man Extreme 2 is the worst of the Extreme duology, and it hurts to say that because I really wanted to like Extreme 2, but I can't. Not like this.